Pour, dans, ce, dans le cadre de ce congrès anglais de Londres que nous, nous avons organisé il y a 30 ans, voilà donc une intervention de Frank Hyde, qui est un personnage qui est assez critique par rapport à l'astrologie. Other people who uh, want to knock it for some reason or other. 
is that they cannot reconcile the two things. Well, the fact is that so far as the first uh, charge is concerned, it really doesn't matter because uh, the actual constellations had nothing whatever to do with the talk. Uh, certainly the conditions of the time group, but as time moves on, we've got procession and procession. Uh, it doesn't change the situation because the situation is not related to the sky. It's related to the situation in which the Earth is, which means that as part of the solar system, it follows the conditions of the solar system. So, uh, provided that you make that known to anyone that you're working for, uh, you can then go along with the ordinary premise. But remember, it is not the actual situation. It's the situation of quite a long time ago. During an ordinary lifetime, the change is not sufficient to make it worthwhile to work. It's a matter of two or three degrees, and this is neither here nor there. But the whole thing is, in fact, simple. But people will insist on making it complex. And this is the same of all basic truths. People add to it, add on to it, uh, mix it with other things, get into a, a whole complete mess with correspondence. They align the Kabbalah with it, which is nothing whatever to do with astrology. They align the Torah with it, which is nothing whatever to do with astrology. And they will not work on the proper situation, which is the solar system. A solar system is a unit in itself. How it came into being, we are still conjecturing, we're still trying to measure. But its influence is uh, unmistakable. But you have to accept one very important thing, that you and every blade of grass or every bit of grit or things you find about are all one and part of the same thing. There is no mysterious something which is special to it works on the normal principles of astronomy and will be up to it. Uh, now, this may sound to you revolutionary if you've been brought up in the old English school of, say, Alan Leo and his father. During the Middle Ages, of course, there were changes of all kinds, uh, and half the time, because of uh, time, was not properly understood, and in fact, it, uh, uh, the very first time that minutes were measured was during the time of uh, Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, even then, they didn't have it. the whole framework on which astronomy rests, and uh, this is a very serious point. When Kepler now, um, I should say counted, I suppose, the laws of celestial mechanics, in which there are three, which determines every moment of our life and being. His instruments were accurate to one degree, and that is the only reason he was able to... Uh, well, I found height on photography, and I'm a syndicate coach. We have no prior knowledge... This is Frank Hyde at the... Company in Bessie, July 1981, with me on his side at the conference. Uh, at the moment, there are hundreds of satellites dropping and re dropping every time they go around. The number of variations are so great that now we have to track the times every year to a matter of a millisecond. And uh, recently, of course, we have to take a jump the whole second because of the change in situation within the solar system itself. Now, for astrology we start at home, which means we start with the moon. Now, you are taught, and rightly so, that the moon goes around the earth. But it doesn't go around the center. The Bruce Brackenridge keep on the keep there. The link between the Earth and the Moon is a gravitational balance. Yeah, that's my, yeah. balance is in fact at a point here, a 
thousand miles below the surface of the Earth. Now this means that this is a balance point for this system and that the Earth and the Moon is a binary system. It's true in the case of our Earth because the Earth is very large uh, compared with the, with the main body, the Earth, um, and therefore exerts a very considerable effect. Now this means that this system rotates around this point and therefore the Earth does not actually, although it rotates on its own axis, it is not the centre of the system. And these are the two bodies that matter fundamentally to us. So when uh, you take Parker. this as a point, then you have a circle which is like that. And in fact, when you're using the Earth, you must consider it to be a body 14,000 miles in diameter and not 8,000 miles. It means that this is the area of the Earth's influence, and this must radically affect the moon. The other thing that we then have to take into account is the sun itself, because the sun is trying to pull the moon away from the Earth and very nearly succeeds under certain conditions. Therefore, the relationships here are wholly dependent on the position. Let's take the case of the moon. Um, let us put the moon down here. Let's put the Earth there. Then, in this condition, you've got eight similar pools on either side. Consequently, the Earth gets pulled out this way and pulled out that way at the same time. When the moon reaches this position, you've got double. Now, if that happens when it's on the elongated side, the strength in this direction is very much greater than when it's the other way. But conversely, the other side, because it's falling away, is greater still. Now, you can understand how that mucks up your circle of time. Do you idea? Because it, it is moving my, yeah. like that all the time. Now, the sun itself is affected by other bodies. I'll come to that later. But let us stick with the moon and the sun. When, uh, when the quadratures come up, and this is important, when the oppositions and when the conjunctions come up, this is important. But there's one other thing which matters a great deal, and that is the declination of the moon and Geometric. the relation of these two points is important because no aspect is exact unless the line passes through the center of the two points. That means that some of these fancy things that we have, for example, um, let us say, take this as a line through the sun, uh, let us say you, you have uh, Jupiter there, and Saturn there, then if they are the same declination but in opposite sign, then that is an opposition. If Saturn happens to be up there, it's not. People cheerfully talk about parallels and things like that, but it's not. It's an aspect in between. And this is determined by the energy of the Sun and the Moon. Now the whole of the the whole of the planets only weigh, or rather, only have a mass of one seven hundred and fifty of the sun. So the sun remains the most powerful body, whatever happens. The distances, of course, affect them in a certain way, and the sun itself is affected by the planets, but no way can the planets, even in totality, do any more than just alter the surface conditions of the sun. But because of uh, the situation that I showed you with the Earth and the Moon, there is, I'll, I'll draw half the gradient, or half the diameter of the sun. Let's put the center of the sun there. Now Jupiter is the heaviest of all the planets and therefore it exerts the greatest effect. And if it stood alone, it would in fact cause the sun to, to Jupiter here, the 
sect of Jupiter is to make the Sun and Jupiter revolve around the point which is 36,000 miles outside what we call the photosphere of the Sun, which is what you can see when you look straight back. Now this means that Jupiter produces a tide on the Sun of quite considerable dimension, and this has effect on every one of the atoms. Similarly, Saturn, which is uh, one of the more powerful bodies, of course, uh, affects a point at about uh, a third of the way in uh, from the center of the Sun. Uranus affects a point a little further over uh, at about 200,000 miles from the center of the Sun. The very difference in those positions and that of, uh, of Jupiter makes all the Saturn reacts in an area in which, we, which is what we call the convection zone, where particles are being moved about and eventually spewed out from the sun itself. Uh, Uranus works at a point where it's very turbulent, and in fact, in many ways, we Uranus can create more uh, variable conditions, like increasing the strength of the solar wind, directly affects everything on Earth. Uh, than in, in fact uh, Saturn. But Jupiter is the great tide moon and producing tides on the Sun just as the Moon produces tides on the Earth. Now all of those variations mean that as far as the Earth is concerned it's probably one of the most unstable things in the universe because it is bouncing like that in uh, a situation of 10 cycles a day it is having a wobble, which we call the Chandler wobble, which wanders 30 or 40 kilometers all over the place. It ha has uh, uh, effects uh, of almost egg shape uh, when lots of planets are on one side. We call this the Earth at the moment. When all the planets are on one side or in one area, one quadrant, then there's a great falling away of energy because the other one half is pulling towards it, the other half, therefore, is dropping away. And all this affects everything in which we live in the solar system. This means that, in actual fact, we are subject, every moment of time, to changes of pressures, changes of pull, and changes of, particularly, of the magnetic field. When the sun is made very active by this sort of thing, as it, uh, of course, will be particularly next year, as some of the heavier planets move from one quadrant, breaking it down into houses, I'll come to in a moment, because they're not as important as they are supposed to be, and this is why you get led astray on to them. Some of what I've just heard uh, is very interesting, because it confirms uh, quite a number of the things uh, which have appeared in the measurements and so on that I've made. Uh, there are lots of correspondences and there are reasons for it. I don't use houses at all. It's a waste of time as far as I'm concerned. I'm only concerned with the four quadrants and the effect of the pools outside. And when the sun is active, it is itself pouring out energy uh, over and above its normal energy uh, in the form of the solar wind. These are particles which are forced out in all directions from the sun and they fall uh, upon the magnetosphere of the Earth and it looks somewhat like if we look at the... Uh, I've got to rub this up. Let's try and have a pretty picture. It's radiating out all the way around. And when it is very strong, of course, the effect of the Parker. solar wind it comes out radially uh, with a certain amount of twist, rather like a vacuum wind. Uh, when it impinges on the magnetosphere of the Earth, what happens to it is that this gets pumped in like that with a long, long tail, which never actually joins up. These are points of very intense magnetic energy. And when the situation of the Earth and the Moon is such that the Moon is passing through any of these um, areas, which are rotating at the same time as the Sun is rotating, as the whole system is rotating, 
each one of these is an important nodal point, and you won't find it in the newspaper because there's no way in which you can show it. These are consequences. And remember, too, that with the Earth rotating on its own axis, that itself causes change. It stirs the magnetic field up. When the sun spots are very strong, this, this uh, solar wind is very strong indeed. When it subsides in the sunspot minima, that is the time when we get influence in from outside the solar system, particularly uh, in the case of some very fast particles which are able to penetrate to Earth, and that's why we get epidemics of diseases of various kinds. And over the last 2,000 years, there are many diseases which have come and gone disappeared. Uh, from the Middle Ages, when the Black Plague and that kind of thing was very common, that is now gone. And when I was a boy, if you had diphtheria, you were isolated from everybody. In fact, mumps were isolated from everybody. And uh, all these great diseases like the tuberculosis, all have now disappeared. Uh, partly this is due to the position of the solar system in the whole of the galaxy itself. And, uh, the ice age comes once every 100, 150 million years, and these little mini ice ages that people are talking about, there's no point to it at all. But that brings me to the point about cycles. Now, people are doing all sorts of things with cycles, and the magazine cycles, of course, uh, they make uh, predictions about everything. And uh, in 99.9 .9 cases, they're absolutely wrong. But they'll do anything. They'll, they'll even do it on sunspot numbers. But there never is, in fact, any complete cycle. Not ever. Because one body is moving in relation to another, and that is why we get the synodic period of the Earth's position around the sun, the moon around the Earth, always they are processing. And this is the main point that you have to remember. Procession is always important. So, isn't it much more sensible to use the natural zodiac as the bodies are themselves? In your own chart, uh, even if you live to be a hundred, you will hardly move a good three or so, so it doesn't matter. For you. And the business of predicting from minutes and seconds, well, uh, in the course of a minute, of course, the surface of the Earth has moved uh, for something like a thousand miles. So you changed all the situation anyway from the very second that you start. You're concerned with the high energies and also the low energies. And very often it only needs a very small change in position for the whole pattern to change again. We've made it complicated ourselves because we go on to use Pluto and uh, we even talk of possible other planets outside. I believe there may be two, uh, because these do affect certain measurements. But before I follow that theme any further and come on to the houses themselves, let me tell you one or two things about the planets. First of all, for those who sublimate all this, those who talk about uh, the esoteric, uh, esoteric tradition, all right, you, it's up to you. But when those ideas were formed, uh, it was when proper and in fact knowledge of what happened wasn't known. So substitutes are known. We work with four elements. Even water itself is so complicated that if you, if you start to divide things up into bits, you'll, you'll be just exactly in the position we are now with regard to Jephthah, in that you won't see the real laws. But there is no need to use this idea of esoteric levels or um, astral bodies and all this kind of thing. The exact thing that is, is the only thing that matters. And in it, it contains all the phenomena that you experience. All right, if you don't understand uh, uh, an altered state, and you say, well, you're astral traveling. All right, it's good to name as any, until you know what's happening. But now we can measure what happens. 
you can make you very easily a stent of samadhi. And some of us can go into samadhi any time we want. But there's nothing transcendental about that. It all happens in here. And this makes it even more interesting because at the moment a lot of people are trying to take refuge because people say, ah, oh, you know, the newspaper one can never write and, and a computer uh, designer will tell you, well, if you had a 10 million memory, you, you might begin to get somewhere about it, but you're still only talking terms of statistics, which is true. And statistics can never tell you what is going to happen. They can only tell you what won't happen. And this is half the problem. But I think uh, anybody concerned with statistics should remember that the very first result of Garfield's uh, measurements and checks throughout the houses locked stop and down because no matter what the pursuit of the person concerned, uh, the whole, uh, if we take, let us take uh, scientists, for example, everyone was random, hardly more than half a dozen out of 25,000 who were born in the, in the same size and so forth at the time. But I'm afraid a lot of people just don't want to see it. But if you look at Gautland's results, uh, which are available to any serious experimenter, you will discover the houses play no part of it. Uh, now, to <coughs> the actual conditions of the planet. As I said, the, the, the masses of the Total, total of the planets and all the asteroids, not only all those that we know, but the thousands that we don't know, uh, they are just a small proportion of the whole. Now, they vary in very, very much among themselves. Mercury, which until a few years ago was said to make only one revolution uh, on its axis, uh, we now know it moves rather faster than that. We know now that it's got a tremendous magnetic field, but it's not quite like the magnetic field we have on the Earth. And Mercury, in spite of the fact that it's a very small body, does have great importance at certain times. And particularly this is so at earthquakes and things like that. Um, Venus, well, it's nearly the same size as we are, and has, of course, many, uh, many features which are quite different. In the early days of science fiction with Edgar Rice Burroughs, of course, Venus was always a hostile place and uh, it was uh, a place of swamps and peculiar people. Well, of course, the, uh, the facts have turned out to be, yes, he was right, he was very hot, but his atmosphere is sulfuric acid. There's no uh, water left except what is in the atmosphere, and that's very little. It is undoubtedly the most inhospitable place in the solar system. And yet we credit with, it, with emotional possibilities and we call it the goddess of love and so forth. Now, all that is part of the pantheon and it's very easy to bring these two together. There's not time to even go into that now, but it's very easy to show that the two things are compatible. And the more, the more extensive measurements we make in particle physics, the more true it becomes. And I, I'd like to make a point before I go on about people will tell you it's impossible to understand relativity unless you're a super duper mathematician. This is completely untrue. Relativity can be understood once you become aware. Become aware, the answer is very simple. All you need the mathematics for is to prove it, if you want to prove it. To, prevent, to accept your experience, then it's all right. The same applies to uh, this new situation which we're moving into now with um, uh, subatomic physics, where we've, we're only just beginning to understand what makes the whole thing simple. And astrology fits in very well. Not the modern astrology, but the older one. And undoubtedly it is true the way back in ages past uh, which have been completely, uh, times which have been completely destroyed by volcanic action and, and um, all sorts of conditions where anything that ever did exist solidly has already been melted into the magma and we shall, there's no way in which we'll ever be able to process it. 
but the conditions of things, to try to say, for example, that <coughs> wild oats could be domesticated in 10,000 years, this is ridiculous. But it still does remain true that the wild oats are much more, uh, um, much more life-giving than the cultivated. In fact, one little strand of ordinary wild oats produced much good in the whole pack for a uh, of the rice uh, crispies and all that kind of thing. Now, let us stick with the earth. Its situation is a unique one, and possibly that's why uh, the development of our kind of life has gone on. In our solar system, there's only one alternative, and that is, uh, ours is the carbon cycle. The only alternative is the silicon cycle. But we couldn't ever have anything to do with them, because their natural temperature will be in the region of 700 degrees back. So there's no possible way of communicating. The uh, possible development on other planets, well, Mars is the most likely one, although it's very cold, it's minus 15 degrees, but there is an atmosphere there. We could build it up very quickly with algae and so on, and I think that Mars will be the first planet to be colonized. There is one other possibility, and that's a satellite of Saturn, Titan, uh, but that's even more hospitable than Mars. And I think, although a lot of people feel now that the, the, it, it could be made a place very much like the Earth, I don't think this will be the case. But the, the moon itself, of course, is hostile, uh, but we could, because it is relatively soft, we could burrow underneath, and certainly we could uh, uh, extract minerals which we could use to replace some of those that have been depleted. But geological time is the thing that counts in this um, Now, if we go to Mars, this great god of war,